First, I just want to thank everybody who has completed the survey we sent out. The feedback has been very helpful in planning the series that we're going to offer again in the spring. So thank you so much. It's really invaluable. It's also been very validating that we did ask Kristen to lead this series because she is clearly a phenomenal educator. And we're so honored to have her relaying this history in a very clear and insightful manner. So thank you, Kristen. And we're gonna hear from her in a few minutes again. Um, for those who would still like to partake in giving feedback, we're putting a link in the chat so you can easily access it. And we would really value everybody's feedback. So thank you. Um, today's lesson is on the WANC conference and the final solution. This presentation includes a virtual tour of portions of the Holocaust Museum in DC and focuses on the meeting that took place at the Wansi House, culminating in the final solution to what the Nazis claimed was the Jewish problem. And then we will have Q&A again at the end. So in case I don't get to it at that point, I'm gonna just remind you what tomorrow is. We'll be looking at an exhibit at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum about Americans and the Holocaust. Um, this, exhibit, this exhibition is a portrait of American society that shows how the depression, isolationism, xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism shaped responses to Nazism and the Holocaust. It reveals how much information was available to Americans at the, Americans at the time and asks why rescuing Jews did not become a priority except for a few individuals who took the risk to help. And this is going to be presented tomorrow by another guest presenter. Her name is Becky Erbelding and she is an author and historian of American responses to the Holocaust. So thank you again for being here and Kristen, take it away. Okay, thanks for your kind words, Susie. And um, about tomorrow's presentation, I've known Becky for quite a while now, and she is a phenomenal presenter and just such a wealth of information. So you're in for a real treat tomorrow. I hope that you're able to join us tomorrow as well. Um, just be quickly before we jump into today's um, program or session, today's going to be a difficult one. And I just want to give you a heads up for that. Um, due to the content, some of the images that you might see, the testimony that we're going to listen to, for those of you who have been with us since the beginning of this, you kind of understand this is the progression, um, especially if you were with us yesterday with Ava and talking about the Einsatzgruppen. But if you're just joining us for the first time today, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, whenever you start talking about the final solution, the Vante Conference, it starts to get into very difficult content to discuss. So with that, just wanted to let you have a heads up and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, like I said yesterday, we were also were very privileged to have a, an incredible guest speaker, Ava Schwaller. And if you were able to join us, then you're well versed and ready to jump into today's session. But for those of you who might be joining us for the first time today, we're just going to have about two or three slides really quickly to give sort of a background of the Einsatzgruppen or the mobile killing unit so that you have some information before we move forward to the uh, final solution. So as the Nazis would march into a country, um, the Einsatzgruppen, which is the German word for the mobile killing unit, which was typically comprised of the security police, which was known as the SS, the intelligence service, or the SD, they would immediately follow to secure this newly seized territory. And they had some specific tasks that they were supposed to take care of. Um, they were to identify and neutralize potential enemies of the Nazi rule. They were to seize important sites prevent sabotage, and recruiting collaborators was probably one of the most important things that they were able to do as they would march into new territories. And then they also established intelligence networks. When Germany attacked Poland, which started the war in September of 1939, the Einsatzgruppen also killed civilians that were perceived as enemies. Um, together, with the units of the Waffen SS, the order police, and these local collaborators, they shot thousands of Jews and tens of thousands of members of the Polish elite as well. With the start of Hitler's war of annihilation against the Soviet Union that he starts in June of 1941, the scale of the Einsatzgruppen mass murder operations vastly increases. And the main targets were communist parties, um, Soviet state officials, the Roma, but above all, it was Jewish people of any age. He wanted all of them gone. So they sort of used this cover of war as an excuse 
to use the pretext of a military necessity, the Einsatzgruppen organizes, and they help to carry out the shooting of more than half a million, um, the vast majority of them Jews in just the first nine months of the war. The local collaborators aided them. Um, they would help to identify those who would become victims as well as aiding with the actual shooting that was taking place. Many of the killers and the victims knew one another, perhaps as neighbors or colleagues. So for example, um, Bobby Yar, just over two days in September of 1941, a small detachment of this Einsatzgruppen, along with some larger units of the Waffen SS, the Order Police, the Ukrainian Auxiliaries, they shot 33,771 Jews at Babi Yar. Um, Babi Yar was a ravine outside of Kiev, and it was one of the largest mass killings at an individual location during World War II. By September 29th and 30th of 1941, most of the Jewish people had already fled. German forces were occupying Kiev, but those who remained were mostly the women, the children, elderly, and people who were ill. The Soviets set off two explosions that quickly took out the newly established German headquarters. And as retribution for this, the Einsatzgruppen rounded up the remaining Jews, again, the women, children, elderly, and ill, and they killed them at Babi Yar, at this ravine. The process used by the Einsatzgruppen is kind of depicted in these photos here. Um, the victims were rounded up and forced to dig a pit which would then become their own mass graves. So you'll see in the photo in the top middle, um, those people have shovels and they're digging their mass grave. Um, oftentimes they would be led into the forest, which you see the picture on the bottom left. Then they would be forced to undress, partly to humiliate them, but also because then any of their valuables, including their clothing, were gonna be taken and used for the German people. Um, so after they're forced to undress, then they would be shot. And there were really heinous, horrible stories of even sometimes they would grab an infant out of its mother's arms and literally throw it up in the air for target practice while the parent watches. So it, it was brutal beyond just lining people up at the outside of this pit and shooting them. Um, sometimes then the Einsatzgruppen would go down into the pit themselves and they would continue to shoot to make sure that everybody was dead. Other times, in order to save those bullets, they would simply come in with a bulldozer and bulldoze over the pile of bodies in the pit in order to bury them. Some people were buried alive. Um, if you've read Elie Wiesel's book, Night, you know that there's a story of somebody who was taken out by this Einsatzgruppen. He was shot, but wasn't killed. Bulldozers came in, buried the pit, and he managed to, to climb back out. And after a day or so, he makes it back to the small village and he warns the people about what is actually taking place and what's happening to the Jews who, you know, everybody else is being told that they're simply being relocated. But the fact of the matter was, it was too terrible to believe. While everybody knew that Hitler and the Nazis wanted the Jews gone, people believed that that meant resettled elsewhere. It couldn't possibly mean annihilating this entire group of people and it was completely unprecedented. So even though there were some, a few early warnings like that, again, it was just simply too terrible to believe. Well, Hitler and the Nazis after a while deemed that this process of annihilating the Jewish people was considered for them. And I hope you understand as I'm putting like little air quotes here, um, that it was too slow and it was too messy. It was seen as inefficient. They wanted a more efficient means of murdering the entire Jewish population in Europe. So hence we get the Vanze Conference and the final solution. These were just a few of, like we said, there were over 33,000 people who were murdered at Babi Yar. Uh, many of them children, as we mentioned. So unfortunately, some of these children were included in that. Um, and for the sake of time today, we're not gonna go through all their names and things, but when you have access to the slides, it'll have little segments about these people as well. Um, the family on the bottom, the father, was warned about what was happening. So he went to see for himself and he actually commits suicide. He falls into a state of depression, but the girls pass themselves off as a non-Jewish family and they do manage to survive. They're some of the very few survivors that we have from Babi Yar. And they went to live in Australia shortly after escaping out of, of Europe. Well, there's no documentation that indicates specifically by whom, at what time, 
and in what way it was actually decided to embark on this idea of total extermination of the Jews. Many scholars believe that such an order was never issued in writing. Instead, it was given orally by Hitler or with his knowledge and in the summer at some point of 1941. On July 31st, 1941, shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union, the Nazi Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring orders Reinhard Heydrich, we're gonna talk more about today. He orders Heydrich to make all the necessary preparations for the final solution to what they call the Jewish problem. And it's going to go beyond Germany too. They refer to it as the German sphere of influence in Europe. So all of the places that they're occupying and planning on occupying as well. Um, so like we said, they've determined that this mass murder by gunfire was failing to meet their expectations. And it was also taking a cumulative toll on the German soldiers performance. If any of you read the book um, by Christopher Browning, Ordinary Men, it talks about the members of the Einsatzgruppen and what they went through psychologically with all of this killing. Um, it's hard to feel sorry for any of them though. Obviously you don't because they volunteered to take part in this, um, but it does give you some insight into what was actually going on. By then too, the Nazi leadership realized that the Blitzkrieg hadn't gone well, that the war against the Soviet Union is not going to end quickly like they had hoped. And again, that this killing by gunfire was not efficient enough and was failing to achieve their goal. So as a result, a decision is made that they're going to shift to an organized systematic murder that's going to be on an industrial scale. The beautiful location of this Bonze conference is in stark contrast to the discussions that are going to take place there. And in German language, W's are pronounced as a V for our language. So it, even though it's spelled with a W, it's pronounced Bonze. So on January 20th in 1922, or excuse me, 1942, um, 15 high ranking Nazi party and government officials are gathered at this beautiful villa in a Berlin suburb called Bonze. And they are going to discuss and coordinate the implementation of what they're referring to as this final solution of the Jewish question. So Reinhard Heydrich, he's the chief of the Reich security main office. He's the one who convenes the conference and he does this to inform and secure support from the government ministries and other interested agencies that are gonna be relevant for the implementation and the success of the final solution. He also discloses to participants that Hitler himself had tasked him and his office with coordinating this operation. So the other people involved, as we go through and you see like what their office is, think about why those institutions and offices that they represent would be important to include in this meeting, why they'd be important for the implementation and success of carrying out the final solution. So we've got Heydrich, who we've already mentioned. Um, then we have Heinrich Mueller, He's an SS in charge of the Gestapo. Adolf Eichmann, whose name is probably more familiar to most of you, um, he was in charge of the deportations, the trains, cattle cars. Um, he also had an overview of the actual numbers of deportations and murders like hardly anybody else had. He's the one who prepared the minutes of this meeting and submitted the notes later. Um, Eichmann later refers to the results of the meeting by summarizing it as simply an expansion of power. There were a lot of code words used when communicating, and yet when they continued to use the same language over and over, and they documented everything so well because they thought that this Reich was going to last for a thousand years and they wanted documentation of how they made this happen. Most of the information that we have is from the Nazis themselves. Um, and after a while, when they continue to use the same phrases over and over, and we know what actually happened, it's pretty easy to start to decipher what they actually meant. Um, Eberhard Schongarth, he was an SS colonel and he was a commander in Krakow, Poland. Then we have Rudolf Lange. He was an SS major. He was in charge of the Einsatzgruppen in Latvia. Otto Hoffmann, he was the chief of the SS race and settlement main office, so moving people from Germany into Poland. Roland Freisler, he was a Ministry of Justice or a judge, and it was important to have the courts on board with this new policy that they're going to implement. And then Wilhelm Kritzinger, he was one of nine lawyers who attended this meeting. So nine out of the 15 of them were lawyers. Um, he was the oldest participant. 
he made sure everything was going to be legal and that there therefore couldn't be any objections that they would have to deal with. This became all the more important when there had been no cabinet meetings since 1938, Hitler had stopped them. So political decisions, including these deportations and these murder programs became legalized under the authority of the Reich Chancellery and in particular by Kristinger through ordinances and laws that sometimes were even passed after the fact. The men seated at the table um, with Heydrich were among the elite of the Reich. More than half of them held doctorates. So again, very educated people who are talking about how to completely annihilate an entire group of people. They were well informed already about the policy towards the Jews, what had already been taking place. And each of them understood that their cooperation of, of their agency was vital if this ambitious, unprecedented policy was to succeed. Then we have Alfred Meyer. He was the Reich Ministry for Occupied Eastern Territories in the Soviet Union. Georg Liebrandt, the Reich Ministry for Occupied Eastern Territories as well. Martin Luther, Under Secretary of State or the Foreign Office, and Wilhelm Stuckart, State Secretary, Ministry of the Interior. The final three. Um, Eric Nauman, his title is a little bit strange, so it's hard to know what that means. So um, he's the plenipotentiary, which is a diplomat who's fully authorized to represent the government. So it'd be similar to what we would think of as an ambassador or an envoy. And this four-year plan that he's supposed to be in charge of, it's a series of economic measures initiated by Hitler. Its primary purpose was to provide for the rearmament of Germany. Um, but aside from emphasizing this rebuilding of the military, which was in total disregard of those restrictions imposed on them by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, it also sought to try to reduce unemployment. So they were going to do this by increasing synthetic fiber production, undertaking public works projects, increasing automobile production, initiating numerous buildings and architectural projects, and then developing the Autobahn system even further. And fearful of the reaction by industrialists and financiers over this increasing nationalization of Germany's economy, Hitler enacted the death penalty for economic sabotage. And so that's part of what Eric Nauman was supposed to be in charge of, was reporting on people and turning them in, keeping an eye on them, that sort of thing. Uh, Joseph Bueller, he was the state secretary, office of the governor of German-occupied Poland, and Gerhard Klopfer, the Nazi party uh, chancellery. So the meeting starts at noon on January 20th in 1942 in that beautiful building in the dining room. And it took them all of 90 minutes to come up with the final solution and talk about how it was going to be implemented and what each person's role was going to be. 90 minutes to talk about the complete annihilation of the entire European Jewish population. Um, like we said, Eichmann was the one who was taking notes and he submitted them. And so there's actually a copy of them. The, the Vante House is open for tours and they now serve as a museum as well. And so they have the, the documents there and you can do a virtual tour online if you'd like as well. So the protocol one, that first document that we just saw, um, that's the minutes of the meeting. Eichmann starts out just listing the participants. Um, he continues with a report on the previous ex expulsions of the Jews and gives a short review of what they call the fight against this opponent so far. But then the meeting shifts and they start talking about the new plan that's going to be laid out. They state that their task or their goal was to legally cleanse the German living space of Jews. It goes on to say that even emigration to leave now is forbidden for Jews. And we talked about how difficult that process was the other day, but now even that is gonna be completely curtailed. No more possibility to leave either Germany or the occupied territories. Heydrich indicated that the Jews in all of Europe are going to fall under the provisions of the final solution. So he included not only Jews residing in the Axis controlled portions of Europe, but also the Jewish populations in the United Kingdom and the neutral nations, Switzerland, Ireland, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, European Turkey. Um, for Jews residing in the greater German Reich and holding the status of subjects of the German Reich in those occupied territories, Nuremberg laws that they had already set out would serve as the basis for determining who was a Jew. So again, 
Um, we talked about this the other day, but the population of, of the Jewish people throughout Europe, this gives you an idea again. So in 1933, there were approximately 9.5 million Jews living in Europe, and they comprise only 1.7% of the total European population. But they want all of them gone. So as they continue on with the notes written in German here, we get to the translation. So the new plan is laid out. Emigration leaving is prohibited. New plan is going to be deporting everybody to the east. They really don't want the camps that they're going to set up, these extermination camps, to be in Germany. They want them in the occupied territories so that the German people won't have quite as much idea of what's really taking place. Preparations are being made for the final solution. So they say that they're gaining practical experience, which means really what they're doing is they're already taking note of how gas works in order to kill people. Nine transport trains have already been sent east from Berlin. And they also note that this deportation and building these places that are going to have these gas chambers as gas is now going to be their final solution, replacing using bullets to kill people. Um, the deportation is going to require the coordinated efforts, including railroad lines for transporting those who are going to be sent to the east. They need contractors and architects with plans to build these camps. They'll then recruit their slave labor um, to physically build the camp. So the Jewish people will build the camps themselves and other prisoners that they have. And then they need to build the gas chambers, which is their so-called efficient means of ridding Europe of all Jews. There was also talk at the conference between the 15 men about prior approval given by the Fuhrer and specific reference is made to Hitler and that he approved of the procedure. Um, the next document talks about the labor force. So on page seven of the protocol, it discusses the labor force in these terms. It says in large columns with separation of the sexes, those capable of work are brought to these areas and employed in road building in which task undoubtedly a great part will fall out through natural means. Any remaining stock will have to be treated accordingly as this is undoubtedly the most resistant part. What they're really saying is that the strongest will be selected to perform labor for the Reich, but the living conditions for the workers and the brutal work itself will eventually kill them off. Those who do survive will be considered the most resistant or the hardest to kill. And if left to live, they would propagate the next generation of Jews, which obviously they aren't going to allow. Um, so they must now be treated accordingly. And this is a term that they use regularly in other documents. Um, that the perpetrators used as a cover term for murdering the prisoners. Not written in the protocol is what they believe should happen to those unable to work, such as the children or the sick. So apparently that just sort of went without saying that they would be murdered immediately. And with regard to people over 65 years of age, the protocol mentioned the creation of an old age ghetto in Theresienstadt or Terezin in the Czech Republic, and that would be created by Reinhard Heydrich. And the last portion of the protocol discussed who's going to be classified as Jewish people and what to do about what they considered mixed marriages and what they called half breeds. Um, they discussed maybe some could avoid deportation, those in mixed marriages, if they volunteered for sterilization. So that that way they wouldn't contaminate Hitler's so called pure Aryan race. They also discussed immediate divorce for those in mixed marriages but worried that the Catholic church might intervene and become critical. And of course they don't want anything to slow down their plans. And so they want to avoid that. So they decide instead that if sterilization is forced it would avoid a lot of the necessary paperwork and administrative work to keep track of it all. So the discussion was not about whether or not they should even do this to annihilate the Jewish people but it was all about what's the best way, what's the most efficient way how do we streamline the paperwork necessary? So the key takeaways or the key facts is now the destruction of European Jewry is official Nazi policy. So this is state sponsored. It would also be organized. It would be the systematic murder on an industrial scale. Um, they're, going, they're talking about coordinating the details and establishing the central role that the SS would play in this. And the fact that nobody objected to the plan. Instead, it was focused on the practical bureaucratic um, matters of who, how many, how would it be carried out, and the paperwork involved. 
So this was really the bureaucratic face of genocide. People's lives and their deaths have been reduced to categories and lists. But when they talked about how they were also gathering um, experience already, the Germans had already employed using gas, gas in their euthanasia program, the T4 program. They had murdered tens of thousands of the physically and mentally disabled until the program was halted due to pressure from the German public and from the clergy. Um, the methods and knowledge, however, that was gained during this euthanasia or T4 program serves as the basis for this systematic mass murder of the Jews, the final solution, which is going to be the gas chambers. So now gassing their victims is going to be the so-called preferred method of death because it's going to be more efficient. So as we said, it's, it's systematic, it's state-sponsored, it's bureaucratic. So again, this was part of the definition of the Holocaust by the US Holocaust Museum. So the steps are isolate and relocate people to the ghetto. From there, they're gonna be deported to one of these camps. Um, once they get to the, the camp, there will be a selection process. Those who are strong enough to work and those who are going directly to the gas chamber but in either way, death is supposed to be the outcome. So either you are to die eventually from the work or from the um, conditions that you are exposed to, starvation, disease, the weather conditions even, um, or if you're going to be gassed, but everybody in the end is supposed to die. And all the while the Nazis are using deception in order to achieve their goal more easily. So this is a postcard that somebody had to write once they had arrived at Treblinka telling others that you know, I've arrived well, I'm safe. So keeping up with that lie about you're just going to be relocated, we're going to put you somewhere else because we don't want you in Germany or in one of the occupied territories so that the people that hadn't been deported yet wouldn't have mass hysteria, they wouldn't try to escape. It was trying to keep people calm because the Nazis found that it was much easier to achieve their task if they kept the people calm. So again, using deception in order to achieve that. A well, quick timeline of when the meeting starts and when things really amp up. So in 1942, the mass murder of the Jews becomes more so-called efficient by this uh, final solution. By the spring of 42, the killing centers were operating. These were camps that were designed not for imprisonment or forced labor, but really just for mass murder. By that summer, the Polish Jews living in the ghettos were being transported to the killing centers. And by the middle of 43, almost the entire Jewish population in Poland itself was pretty much annihilated. So a scholar had noted that as these 15 men gathered at Wannsee, four of five Jews who were to be murdered in the Holocaust were still alive. 15 months later, in the spring of 43, four of five were already dead. Um, so at this point, we're going to go back to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. and continue on with part of our virtual tour. Um, if you remember, the first, first time we did this, we talked a little bit about the architect, James Ingo Fried, how he was a German-born Jew himself who came to the United States after Kristallnacht. And we talked about the, um, the Hall of Witness and the Tower of Faces. So today we're going to go to the second floor of the museum that describes the isolation exclusion and deportation and eventual murder of the European Jews. And hopefully this works okay today. Um, so on this floor, we see things like the ghettos. So after invading Poland and later the Soviet Union, um, the Germans sought to isolate and control the Jews by forcing them to live in marked off segregated sections of towns and cities that they called ghettos. The Germans created at least a thousand of these ghettos and the conditions included extreme overcrowding and hunger. And again, the eventual plan is that they're going to kill them anyway. So if they died in the ghetto first, well, it was one less person to transport to a camp to kill later. Um, contagious diseases spread very rapidly because of the unsanitary conditions and the overcrowding. Tens of thousands died in the ghettos from illness, starvation, again from the weather, from the cold. Um, from 1942 to 44, the Germans emptied the ghettos and began deporting the Jews to these camps and killing centers.
and this part here shows um, one of the bridges that people would have to take to get in and out of the ghetto to go to one of the factories where they were working. And again, they were keeping them completely separated from the rest of the population. So the trolley down below is for the German people, but up above on this bridge, that's how they're taking the Jewish people out of um, the ghetto to march them to a, a factory where they're going to work and then send them back. And so they had to go up and over the road and they were of course guarded the whole time. Um, then when we get to the next portion on the floor, on the second floor, um, beginning in 1942, the Nazis are systematically deporting the Jews in rail cars. And if you've been to the museum, you know that when you get to this part, you can actually walk through the rail car, as you can see here. And there's a very distinct odor to the, the rail car. Um, it just smells sort of musty, et cetera. But when you stand inside there for just a moment, and you start to imagine how many people were crammed inside of each of these cars. It's just, it's hard to even fathom. There were typically 100 to 120 people in each rail car. Um, where this walkway is, is where the door would be that is going to shut. And you'll notice because it's used for hauling cattle, that there are no seats involved, that um, there are no windows. You have these little spots, these little slats on the top where maybe some air can come in. But again, you're going to be exposed to the elements. So whether they're being transported during the oppressive heat of the summer or the bitter cold of the winter, you're definitely going to feel it in these box cars. And you've already come from the ghetto where again, you weren't being given proper food. The conditions were very unsanitary. So people are already getting weak and they're getting sick. And now you're going to have to withstand this journey. And depending upon which ghetto you're at and which camp they're transporting you to, you could spend days, even up to a week on in this cattle car waiting to get to the camp. And of course, they continue on with this lie. So they're told that they should pack one suitcase. They're told what kinds of items to bring. Um, and they're told to write their name on their suitcase, et cetera. So again, it's keeping up with this lie that you're simply going to be deported. Sorry, thank you, Susie. Susie told me that the pictures weren't changing. I apologize for that. So we'll go back to the rail car and hopefully you can see. Um, so there were five killing centers that the Germans had, that the Nazis had created specifically for this final solution. So Kelmno, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec, and probably the one that most people have heard of is Auschwitz-Birkenau. And they were all built specifically for carrying out this final solution. They were all located in German occupied Poland. And that distinction is important. We don't want to say it was just Poland because at this point the Nazis are occupying. So it is the Nazis who have built these camps with the intention of annihilating the Jewish people. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest and the Nazis and their collaborators killed almost a million Jewish people just at Auschwitz-Birkenau alone. And here are some of the photos of the people then arriving at the camp. And this is the selection process. So again, separating men from women, um, people who looked like they could carry out work compared to those who were already weak, too old, too young, et cetera. And this usually only took a matter of maybe minutes. People were separated and you'll hear some of the survivors talk that you know they didn't even have time to say goodbye to their family members. First of all, they didn't know that that was going to be the last time that they would see them because they have no idea what's going to happen to them inside this place. But again, they were told that they're going to be relocated from the ghetto, that there will be a job waiting for them in many cases, that it's going to be a better place. And they knew that the Nazis wanted them away where people wouldn't have to interact with them, but they had no idea that they were going to be taken to a camp like this. And so again, they're told what to pack, what to bring with them. And that's where they think that they are going. So instead, when that door opens finally on the cattle car train, and instead you're met with soldiers, um, oftentimes German shepherds barking at you, searchlights going, people are yelling at you, leave your suitcase, get in line, and they start separating you. And all of that happened with just a matter of a few minutes.
So now we'll get to the next section of the museum. Um, here we go. So this gives you an idea of what the barracks look like. So those who would be selected for work, you're now going to live in these barracks. Um, oftentimes the roof would leak. And so there's going to be rain and snow coming in on you. Again, you'll notice that there's no mattress, no pillows. Typically there would be six people in one of these bunks. And so as one person turns in the middle of the night, everybody has to turn. Again, because of the overcrowding, the unsanitary conditions, diseases are spreading. So of course, if you're sleeping next to somebody who's getting sick, the chances of you contracting it are also very high. Um, and so this is where you would sleep. And then you're supposed to get up at five in the morning, stand outside for roll call that often lasted for hours and then complete whatever your assigned task was that day for work. Sometimes the work was something that they would simply make up where you're moving huge boulders from one side of the camp back to the other just because they wanna give you something to do. Other days you were actually constructing something. But again, oftentimes, you know, the, the portions that you were given, the rations of food might consist of what they called soup, but oftentimes it was just water that actually had garbage in it. Um, one piece of bread and they've talked about how different people would actually fight over that piece of bread because that was your means of survival or not. But horrible conditions that existed inside the barracks. Medical experiments were also taking place at the camps and that's what you would see behind this, this wall that's to protect little kids so that they don't see those kinds of disturbing images. Uh, but you'll see the prisoners lined up here, ready for work. And again, when they come in, then they have their heads shaved. And we're going to hear from a survivor in just a minute. So I want to get to that just so you can hear it from their own words. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what it was like when they were shaved and then the, the uniform that they were given and what it was like to have to work. Those who were deemed not fit to work were going directly to the gas chambers. And so they would... Once again, they'll be told all of these lies that they're simply going to go in and have a shower because the trains were filthy and they have lice. And so they wanted to get them all cleaned up is the lie that they're telling them. Excuse me. <clears throat> and from there, let me get to the right part of the picture here. Um, they're going to be shoved into a shower room that holds about a thousand people and this big heavy door that you see is hermetically sealed and there's a little tiny peephole up here where the soldiers can then look through to make sure that everybody has died. On the bottom here, these are cylinders of Zyklon B, the gas that is gonna be poured in. And if we get to the next section here, it actually walks us through the gas chambers. So again, upon arrival, the people up on top are being told that you're going to go in and you're going to have the shower. They're told to go down below and that's the dressing area and that they are supposed to take off all of their clothes. Oftentimes they're even told, you know, make sure you look at the number where you're hanging them on the hook because you're going to need them later. Again, part of the lie to keep people calm. Um, so they're forced to undress in front of everybody else. They're then and here you can see from the sculptor, it's very detailed when you get up very close to um, this artwork that depicts what the killing centers were actually like. So then you proceed into the shower area. And of course there are shower heads coming down from the ceiling to make it look like a shower, but they're not connected to any source of water. They're just there, again, part of that deception. Once inside, um, there's a soldier who goes up on the roof and he puts on a gas mask and he takes one of those canisters of the Zyklon B and it's, it's pellets that are inside the canister. He dumps them through this vent and it goes into the shower room and you'll notice the people are clenching their throats, they're gasping for air. What happens is your lungs actually burst inside your chest cavity. It's a horrible inhumane way, way for anybody to die the people, the Jewish people who were forced to then remove the bodies and take them to the crematorium to burn them afterwards, those who survived said that every time that they came to the gas chamber to take the bodies out, they found the same thing. Um, 
after the soldiers would go and look through that peephole to make sure that people were no longer moving around, everybody was dead, they would kick on a fan that, that takes all of the gases out so it was safe to enter again. But the Jewish people who worked in there, the Sonder Commando talked about, they would find the bodies stacked up like a pyramid. People would stand on those who died first, the ones who were right underneath the vents. They would stand on them trying to reach that vent so that maybe they could push it open and get some sort of fresh air. Um, there are, if you go to Auschwitz, you can actually see there are scratch marks on the ceiling. So obviously this was a horrible, horrible way for people to die. Again, completely innocent people. They have done nothing to anybody. Um, and then the last step is the bodies are taken to the crematoria where they are burned in these furnaces that are built specifically for this purpose, again, of this industrial kind of killing. By the end of the war, they were um, burning about six to 10,000 bodies a day. People near some of the camps had actually talked about there was so much ash falling, it was like snow that they would have to shovel and they didn't really understand what it was from or where it was coming from. But they also said that there was a very distinct odor in the air from the burning flesh. So the idea that people didn't really know what was happening, people who maybe lived in nearby communities, clearly they knew that something was wrong and that this was not normal. I'll just get to the next slide real quickly here. Um, so at the museum, some things that you'll also see that just aren't on that, that tour is when you are near the, the rail car, you will see the luggage or the bags that people were bringing. And of course, their names are printed on it. Again, part of that deliberate lie that they're told. All of the belongings that these people brought with them were then used. They were given back to the Germans. And so there were warehouses. When the Allies finally come in and liberate, they found warehouses of all of these goods. So the person up on top is sifting through people's rings, wedding rings and other rings, um, eyeglasses. Everything was going to be used by the Reich. I think for me, one of the things that gets me every time, even though I've been through the museum, I don't even know how many times anymore, but every time I come to the exhibit that has the shoes, it just stops me in my tracks. Um, I'm just thinking about it now, still gets me, sorry. Like I said, when you go through the cattle car, there's there's an odor to it. It's the same thing when you come to the shoes. Um, it looks like just this pile of shoes, but as you can tell from some of these other pictures too, when you start to really look at each one individually and you think about the fact that those belong to a person, that was someone's life. And you wonder what might they have gone on to do had their life not been taken from them so early and for no reason. So the picture on the bottom shows one of the camps that was liberated by the allies and this enormous pile of shoes that was there. I mean, it's hard to fathom that even because what we have at the museum is a very, very small sample of the shoes and it's rotated with other camps and other museums and things so that um, they're not exposed to the elements for too long and our curators restore them, et cetera. But there's a quote on the wall by the shoe exhibit and it says, we are the shoes. We are the last witnesses. We are the shoes from grandchildren and grandfathers from Prague, Paris, and Amsterdam. And because we are only made of fabric and leather and not of blood and flesh, each one of us avoided the hellfire. Which seems just, it, like I said, it, you can't even fathom it. The shoes were worth saving because that was going to be used for the Reich, but the people were expendable. Um, so the warehouse full of belongings, things even like hair, these are um, bales of hair that were found at Auschwitz when the Allies liberated. The hair was used to stuff mattresses, stuff pillows, and even woven into cloth, as you see in the, the photos there. At the museum in DC, we only have photos of the hair. The survivors that were consulted and the members of um, the museum board really didn't want the hair display, they said that was something that was alive and living on the person. And so in their view that that needed to be buried and given a ceremony. Um, however, at Auschwitz, if you go there, 
it's different. That that place um, is an authentic historic site. It is hallowed ground. Ashes fell there, people perished there. And so it makes more sense for them to actually display the hair. And that was a choice that the people who have turned Auschwitz into a museum and a memorial, they made their own decision. But at the museum in DC, you'll only see photographs of it. So now we're going to listen to a couple of different survivors talk about their experience on the cattle cars and reaching the camps. And we might have to skip through a couple of these to get to the end, because I also want to talk want to talk about what happened to the perpetrators, the people who attended that Bonze conference at the end of the war, what happens to each of them. When we arrived to Auschwitz, the minute they opened the wagons, it was just total, complete uh, misery, beatings and screamings and beatings and barking of dogs and growling of dogs and, and whistles of trains and screaming and beating and screaming and, and commands given. It was just it was just like you open the doors and all of a sudden you find yourself in this inferno, in this, in this, in this, in this unimaginable uh, 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 horror that you, as an adult or a child, uh, would see nightmares. And it was just coming through. Uh, and we were just hauling on to each other and, and uh, I don't know, within minutes, my mother and my sister were dragged to one side and I was dragged with my dad to another. We were told to go to another side. And uh, they never had a chance to say goodbye to my mother, never had a chance to say goodbye to my sister. Uh, the, 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 uh, the pace, the speed of this, this thing, it was done by design. It was done to, to both for, for the person not to be able to comprehend or understand or, or in any way be able to think for a second what was happening. It was just incredible. It was just an incredible uh, uh, situation. And uh, it was just, as I tell it to you now, it's difficult for me to even describe it because it was happening on a minute-to-minute on a -minute, uh, situation. And uh, I got into the I got into this line. It was this big line, and uh, I saw my mother on the other side. It was a, another side where the women went, and uh, I, I I never saw her cry. I don't. I never saw her reach out. She just the last time I saw her, she was hanging on to my sister, and my dad hollered to her, "You hang, you you take care of her. I'll take care of him." in Yiddish. And uh, whatever we have to do, this was the last word I heard. And uh, my dad threw me in front of him. And uh, he says, keep walking very tall, don't even, because we were observing what was going on in the front, you know, in the front of the lines. And uh, the, very, the one thing you didn't want is for the Germans to, to see that you were holding on to your child because that was the whole idea, is to break up the family, murder the family. Uh, that was the genocide of the whole thing. So by not identifying that this is your child, there was a little bit of an edge you had to possibly survive. The fact that you were on your own and you sort of didn't belong to any family. When we arrived up. So again, just to give you an idea of where the camps were located as they talk about their time on the, the cattle car and where you might be coming from as far as one of the ghettos. These were some of the main routes that show the transports that are going to the extermination camps, which were all located in German occupied Poland. So again, your time spent on a cattle car could be a matter of days, could be up to a week or longer. And these were the five killing centers that were built specifically for this purpose. Um, Majdanek, it was thought, was actually one of 
the original ones built for this too, but later it was discovered that maybe it shouldn't be included in that category. So it's really the five, it's Auschwitz, Kelno, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec. And we'll listen to her story as well. Um, she's gonna talk about the deportation of her family from the ghetto that was in Hungary to Auschwitz. They told us a day before that we can pack one small suitcase and we should be ready to leave the ghetto. When we came to the, it was a, um, at one time, a factory for um, bricks. And there they started to search us again. The SS was there also. And every woman had to, and every girl had to undress naked. And we were searched internally for valuables. My mother was a very religious person, and all I could think of was how terrible this is for my mother to go through something such, such a terrible ordeal. When we were finished, my mother took the baby from my sister, because she, she was holding the little boy, Danny, and she had a bottle of milk for the child. And the SS grabbed the bottle of milk and said, let's see, you cow, what you have there. My mother pleaded, please, this is the child needs the milk. Please don't take the milk from, from my grandson. He started to beat her with a horse whip. And when I saw that she was being beaten, so I screamed, so at least I got away the attention from my mother. And so my mother ran into the, because the trains were, were right there. We were just, you know, going into those uh, cattle trains. So I took away the attention from my mother and he started to beat me with that whip. And finally, um, I was able to run away also and we were finally in the cattle train. And just for the sake of time, we're just gonna click through these um, one after the other. And there we were in the train, over a hundred people. The only facility in the train was two buckets for over a hundred men, women, and children. And the train was standing on one place. It was unbearable hot. Lack of air. So some people had an idea that the minute we start moving, it's gonna get cooler. <clears throat> but at one moment we heard that the gate opened up in the box car. So we thought maybe they changed their mind, they're gonna leave us out. But instead they brought a few dozen Jews discovered in a hiding place. They were all badly beaten up because they were hiding. I remember one young man, all his front teeth was kicked out. And one boy's face was so badly swollen. It was just a nose that we could see, no eyes. And they added to our car. And soon we started to move. It didn't cool off. And at one moment, we had a young teenage girl crying. She had to go to the buckets in front of everybody. Her mother, her sister tried to shield her with a coat. A man was begging the people around to give a little more room, his pregnant wife. Me being among the youngsters, I was asked to climb up those packages and look out to see where we're going. I started reading signs. One recognized those names. It 
said that we are moving south towards Krakow. I also saw some Polish peasants lining the road. They were probably used to those scenes, those trains. Some made signs to us pointing to the sky and some went with the fingers across the throat, the throat. I didn't tell the people what I saw. Clearly people knew what was happening if they're pointing to the sky, meaning the ashes going up from the, the um, crematoriums. And of course, making the slash across the throat, knowing that those people were marked for death. The train arrived in the middle of the night, so we were greeted by very bright lights shining down on us. We were greeted by soldiers, SS men, as well as women. We were greeted by dogs and whips, by shouting and screaming orders to try to empty the train, by confusion, and by men in striped uniform. We didn't know it at the time, but the men in uniform were the Jews who were brought there before us. They were called Canada, which I found out later. Their job was to empty the train. One of those men saved my life. That was the first. When they had asked us to empty the trains, these men would come onto the compartment of the train, and they would try and push and pull us off the train as fast as they could. These men were not allowed to speak to us, but in their own way, they tried to help young people. They walked amongst us, and in Yiddish, would whisper to a child, you're 15. Remember, you're 15. When we got off the train, and they asked us to line up according to age, Lined up, but I became 15 years old. I lined up with the 15 year olds, and I truly believe that that man, whoever he was, saved my life. And of course, your age helped determine if you were going to be part of the workforce or if you were going directly to the gas chambers. But coming off the train, you would have no idea when they ask you your age what number is supposed to save your life or what, what the difference is going to be. We're just going to listen to one more. Um, very quickly. This is the same woman that you heard before. It's just a different time that she's giving her testimony. So she's dressed differently. But again, this is her mother that is over here, who was part of the Auschwitz album. There's a link on this. So when you receive the link to the materials, you can go on here to read more about the Auschwitz album and find out how they were able to get some of these pictures, etc. But that's her mother and the little boy, Danny, that she's referring to. This will be the last one that we will watch. Listen, if you have uh, children, then give it away to, to either older people or other women with children, because women and children and uh, anybody older is going to be killed. They're killing the same night, the same day. There are no chance, chance for these people to survive. I couldn't even believe it. And my mother had the presence of mind as soon as she heard that. She didn't know this is my mother when this man said it. She ran down with me, and, and I ran after her. And she goes over to my sister, and, and she has the presence of mind to tell her, listen, darling, I just found out that women and children will have it very easy. All they, will, all they are going to do is take care, is take care of the children. but and, and if I don't have a child, then they will send me on hard labor. You know, I will never survive hard labor. But you are young, and you'll be able to survive. And before she has a chance even, you know, in, before my sister had a chance, you know, to, not to give the child, my mother removed the child from her arms. And, and, and as soon as she removed, she had the child in the arms, she was pushed to this other side, you know, with all the women and children. And me and my sister were, were pushed to the other side. 
And my mother still yelled out. She yelled out to me, not to my silica, take care of your sister. Because she knew, she knew that my sister will suffer. Then she'll find out where she took her grandson. I don't know if that one was hard to hear or not. I apologize if it was, but um, somebody in their family had given a watch to one of the workers to find out what was going on with the two different lines. And when they found out that anybody with a child was getting sent directly to their death, the grandmother grabs the grandson out of her daughter's arms so that her daughter will be saved and that she and the grandson will be the ones going to their death. And so that's why she tells her other daughter to take care of the one that she just took the child from because she knows what a difficult time she'll have once she realizes what actually happened to them. And again, it all happened in a matter of seconds. And we are, ooh, we are out of time. Um, so at the end of this, however, and like I said, you'll get the link to all of this, but it, it tells you what happened to each one of these men who was part of the Bonsai Conference. There was an assassination attempt on Heydrich. It failed, but he dies from infection from his wounds. Some of the others um, do end up getting held accountable. Perhaps you've heard of the Eichmann trial, but others either commit suicide, they get very light sentences. Um, so the question really is, you know, is this really justice for these people who killed so many. And for many of them, they actually have records of how many people they were responsible for killing because they were in reports, et cetera. So I apologize, we're out of time once again. Kristen, thank you so much. There's so much to process here. Wow. Um, there was one question that came earlier in the presentation. So I just wanted to get to that real quick and then we can say goodbye for the day. But um, the question was regarding the mobile gas vans. Were they already being experimented with at the time of the Vansi conference? What's the timing of that? They were. The mobile gas vans had been used prior to this. Um, that was part of the T4 experiments. And so those were already, yes, in the works. The German people actually found out about this and the clergy because they were being used mostly on people in institutions for mental handicaps, physical handicaps. Some of the families were receiving a death certificate and then a, a couple weeks later they'd get another one and several people within one community all got sort of the same one saying that your child just you know out of the blue all of a sudden died from pneumonia etc and then they'd get a second death certificate and it just wasn't adding up so people started asking questions and the clergy got involved and they found out what was happening that the people at these institutions were actually being killed and so that put a stop to it so clearly you know, people rising up against this and saying, this is wrong, we're not going to accept it, we're not going to look the other way, it made a difference. Um, but then when it comes to the, the Jewish people, people weren't standing up and it was a um, very different story, obviously. But yes, the gas fans were being used before they actually went to the gas chambers. Okay, thank you. And then uh, if you have time, one more question just came in wh asking why the rail lines going into the camps were not destroyed by the US and allies. That is always a question. Um, quite honestly, it, it's hard to justify the reasoning, but yes, they, we did actually, the US managed to get some spy photos from the airplanes going over. They knew where the rail lines were coming towards the end of the war. But the US military decided that they needed to stick with their military objective, which was to win the war, meaning to stop Hitler, not necessarily that they were fighting to save the Jewish people. So they could have taken out the rail lines. It probably would have saved people from going to the camps. But they made the choice to continue bombing military installations, things of that nature, rather than focusing on the rail lines. Not, not an easy answer to stomach by any means, but those are the kinds of decisions that are made at a time of war. All right. Thank you so much, Kristen. Another like deeply horrific, informative session. Another heavy much day. Appreciation. We will hope to see everybody tomorrow when we go over Americans and the Holocaust. Take care. Thanks, everyone.